<coughs> Welcome to the last of this year's King's Second World War Research Group seminars. Thank you all for turning up. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Peter Reed, and um, whose research is focused on the Second World War, the Western Front, Normandy, and that's what he's going to talk to us about today. And hopefully that will be of some use to your staff ride in Normandy, and also on the First World War on the Eastern Front in the Ukraine in particular. Um, Peter's MA and PhD were at the University of Munich. After that, he spent about 10 years at Sandhurst and is currently at the Center of Military History and Social Studies of the German Armed Forces. So, looking forward Which is that one here? Centrum für Militärgeschichte. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan, for these nice words. And a uh, great hello to every one of you and good afternoon. From my time at Sandhurst, I know the most difficult time to lecture is right after lunch. Yeah? Tough luck for me. Uh, I'll try my best to do some clapping or some dancing yeah, to keep you awake. Let's see how it goes. Okay, um, as I already said, my presentation will be about the German perspective on the Normandy battle, on the other side of the hill. The army, and also I'm sure the Air Force and the Navy, they all love having at the start of a presentation the aim. So just have a read through it. You're all familiar with English. Uh, <laughs> Apologize my accent, yeah, I'm afraid. Like, Ten years, ten years of Santos couldn't make me a full Brit. Uh, so just to read. Yeah. <laughs> Finished reading. Yeah, I, I know grammatically it's probably not, not fully correct, but it doesn't flow. I always ha got this comment. Yeah, Peter, your English is okay. It's, it's good. Grammatically all is correct, but it just doesn't flow. Uh, that was always a morale booster, I can tell you. <laughs> um, right. Here, that's the structure. I also have a read through it. I don't know whether we can make it to, the, to this point here, the fifth point. In my first presentation this morning, I ran out of time, so I had to drop this one. OK. Clear? OK, now your part ends, yeah? You've read enough, now I'm starting talking. Good. First, um, first chapter, the West in the German strategic thinking. So 1940, as you pro all probably know, German overran the, the Low Countries and France within six weeks. And after that, Hitler tries to invade uh, Britain. But after the Battle of Britain is lost, um, Hitler and the German armed forces lose interest in the West. And now they turn eastwards to fight the war against the Soviet Union. France and the Netherlands and Belgium for the army are more or less, in the following months and years, only a refitting area for divisions that were badly hit and badly molded on the Eastern Front and sent for some peaceful and quiet time to the West. After being a couple of weeks, they were transferred again to the East. France, occupied France, is important, particularly in one sense, still for the Germans. And that is in an economical pers economic perspective. It is, of all German-occupied areas, the most important one, due to a number of reasons. First, France produces goods that are later exported to Germany, and that, again, frees up capacities of the German war industry to produce uh, arms and ammunition in German factories. Second, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands also produce um, weapons and are, or also produce something for the German war industry it's themselves. Just to give you some figures, 24% of the German communication equipment is produced in the occupied West, and 32% of the ships used by the Germans are also produced in the West. The most important economical, economical factor is certainly the forced labor. You've got late 1943, about 700 to 750,000 French prisoners of war and Belgian prisoners of war working either in the German industry or in the German agriculture. Totally legal, yeah, but that's the way it is. Yeah, got a big massive pool of uh, yeah, prisoners of war working for the Germans. Um, and you've got now it comes perhaps a bit less legal so, but would be too complicated to explain it. You've got also late 1943, over a million, between 1.1 and 1.2 million civilian workers, French and Belgium and Dutch, working in the German war industry. Crucial, 
In order to understand this uh, occupation period between 1940 and 1944, and why everything went relatively smoothly from a German perspective, is the cooperation between the Germans and the Vichy French government. Yeah, Vichy, uh, old Marshal Philippe Pétain. And this cooperation is important for the Germans in three ways. First of all, as I just said, for labor and economic reasons. Second, the civil administration. The Germans don't touch the, the French civil admin administration. Everything remains intact. Uh, only if a senior civil, uh, civil servant perhaps gets a bit unreliable in German eyes, he's being replaced. Yeah? But apart from that, the Germans, let's say, let the French be the French and let, let them run their own country because this frees up manpower for ourselves. And the same is also true for the, the third point, for the security forces. Germany, or the Germans have got only between 2,000 and 3,000 German policemen are serving only in France and about only 60,000 occupational troops, yeah? I'm not talking about all the troops deployed on the, on the coastline, but in the, in the hinterland of France, you've got only between 40 and 60,000 German soldiers. The, the security itself is done by the French police. Why? Because the French, Vichy France, and the Germans share some of the em enemies. They hate the, uh, they hate the communists, and they hate the Gaullists, so the free French. And this cooperation works pretty well for, for the Germans, yeah, almost until the liberation in 1944. Right. So after three years of being neglected, the West receives new attention in late 1943 when Hitler issues a new strategic directive, the Directive Number 51, which says we should destroy an Allied landing in the West, and then with the forces freed up, we turn against eastwards. Uh, so in his Directive Number 51, Hitler explicitly says, I quote, the danger from the East still exists, but a bigger one is looming, the Anglo-Saxon landing. If the enemy succeeds here in breaking into our front, the consequences will be unpredictable. Consequently, I cannot accept it anymore that the forces in the West are further weakened at the expense of other theaters of war. I have therefore decided to reinforce the forces in the West." End of quote. So what happens? In the following months, so late 1943, early 1944, the Germans sent a number of armored divisions to, to the west, or also raise some new infantry divisions. And also Hitler sends his most popular general, or field marshal, to France, Erwin Rommel. And Rommel is in charge of building up a fortification line, we'll come later to that, the Atlantic Wall, is in charge of the defense preparations against an Allied landing. Rommel, the man who is extremely popular amongst the German public and also amongst the soldiers, he is seen as a kind of morale booster, both for the public and for the German soldiers. So here you can see some numbers. German army manpower is increasing in the following months. Um, uh, at the start of the invasion, you've got uh, about 880,000 German army personnel in France and in the Belgium and the Netherlands. On top of that, you've got about 150 to 200,000 men from the Navy, plus about 300,000 from the Air Force. Yeah? Air Force over, always overmanned, German Air Force. Uh, 300,000 men for about 350 operable aircraft. Yeah? Quite a big one. <laughs> okay, still despite the fact that Hitler now focuses on the West in 1944 with his directive number 51, the majority of the German divisions are still deployed to the Eastern Front. Here, look at the numbers. 170 about, in May 1944, 170 divisions. Divisions, yeah. Uh, British Army today, how many do we have? Four, two, uh, uh, German Army, same. Yeah. Okay, um, 170 still deployed on the Eastern Front. Western Front, 55 plus. The Allies also soak up additional German resources on the Italian front and also in the Balkans where the Germans are always 
with expecting an Allied landing. Good. And the Germans think the oncoming battle in the West, this or the upcoming battle in the West, that will be the decision of the war. And also German propaganda tells us every single German soldier. Come on. So, how did this strategic thinking impact on the German, op German operational plans? So, for the Germans it's clear they are on the defense in the West. But, according to their thinking, they should regain the initiative as quickly as possible. Through a short and sharp fight and a quick victory. So, more or less a German recipe from the first years of the war. Huh? Small, as not small, short, fast campaigns of trying to regain the initiative and destroy the enemy forces. That's something they're trying to copy now in the defense in the West. The main question is where is this battle fought being fought? On the coast or in the hinterland? And here we've got the two proponents, do you say proponents? No, the, two, the two generals supporting each solution. On the left, we've got Field Marshal Rommel, who you all know. He was not very popular amongst his uh, general colleagues. Yeah? He was considered as an upstart with a middle class background, very popular with Hitler and close ties to Hitler. That's something I didn't like. And, but in comparison to his colleagues, he was very popular amongst his men. Because Rommel was someone who led from the front, who shared the hardship with his men. And that's why they were always felt loyal to him. And Rommel has got extensive experience from fighting the Allies in North Africa. He knew what it was like to fight against the Brits and the against the Americans, against all this superiority in material. He knew what it meant. The other person, General Leo Geyer von Schweppenberg, as you can always see from his name, he's not from a middle class background, he's an aristocrat. Yeah? Also, the way he looks, yeah, he looks also very... <laughs> I think the Brits wouldn't like him. No, the Brits actually liked him a lot. He was military attaché in the 1930s in London. Cosmopolitan, spoke six foreign languages. Um, Hitler was always a bit skeptical about him because he represented the old guard, the old elite. Um, armored warfare specialists, specialist, clever person. The problem with him only was that his military experience, even though he knew the Brits from peacetime yeah, in the 1930s, he had only seen action, or predominantly, let's say, predominantly seen action on the Eastern Front. And his idea is, we shouldn't fight the Allies at the sea, we fight them in the hinterland. Let them land, let them come, and then we throw them back with a big punch with our concentrated armored forces. Recipe from the Eastern Front has always worked, should also work against the Allies. Because according to him, and not only to him, to the majority of the German generals, the Allies are just second division. Uh, they are not the Champions League. Rommel knew it better. So, the Germans were facing a number of problems prior to D-Day. The Luftwaffe, so the Air Force, badly, badly hit in the, over the skies of Germany. Yeah? The bo bombing war over Germany, yeah? Boom, 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 boom. Uh, a lot of controversy still today about it. However, the big pro, in my opinion, the big argument for the bomber offensive is without the bomber offensive over Germany, D-Day wouldn't have been possible because it meant that the Germans, German Luftwaffe gets worn down over the skies of Germany. So in late, uh, sorry, in early 1944, spring 1944, the Luftwaffe is no longer a match for the Royal Air Force and for the U.S. Army Air Force. U.S. Army Air Force, it's true, it, they were called like that in the Second World War. And the Kriegsmarine, yeah? the Kriegsmarine with the U-boats, yeah? Das Boot, yeah? you know this, ooh, ooh, yeah? uh, pretty, pretty good in sinking some of uh, a number of ships until 1943, uh, when the Battle of Atlantic was lost for the Germans. Um, and also the Kriegsmarine couldn't influence an oncoming landing in the West. Another problem for the Germans, command and control. Yeah? You may think, oh, the Germans, masters of war, <laughs> always very efficient and effective. Oh, oh. Very well organized. Well, not like here in the Second World War. Hitler, very much in his, how he ruled 
the occupied areas and also how he ruled his own empire, divide and rule. Give everyone some special responsibility here and exception there. In the end, the entire German chain of command prior to D-Day and after D-Day was a big mess. Uh, everyone had special responsibilities and this armored division is only subordinated for tactical purposes. This one is only uh, subordinated for disciplinary reasons and so forth and so on. So quite a bit of a, uh, I already said mess. Yeah. Third problem for the German, shortage of manpower. For three, we, three years, the Germans have been fighting an extremely bloody and atrocious war on the Eastern Front. And just to give you the number to, to understand the sheer scale of this war is the Germans lose per day since the 22nd of June 1941, when the Operation Barbarossa on the Eastern Front starts, per day the Germans lose between 1,500 and 2,000 men irreplaceable, i.e. being killed in action or being taken prisoner. 1,500 to 2,000 men each day. Ah, that has got a certain impact, as you can imagine. Another problem, shortage of supplies. German army, culture of the German army, is always uh, favor the, uh, the teeth arms and forget the tail. Yeah? Um, so logistics, yeah, something the Germans have always neglected. Um, just to give you one example, uh, also with, with production of ammunition and so forth and so on, there's something the Germans couldn't keep up anymore. Just to give you one example, um, the ammunition in the bunkers and the, at the Atlantic Wall. Uh, each bunker should have ammunition for a sustained fight of about 48 hours. In reality, they had only ammunition for about six hours. And in order to overcome all these problems, at least a partial solution was the Atlantic Wall. I think you've all heard this name before. It did not only stretch along the French coast or the Belgium and the Dutch coast, it also stretched along the da Danish coast and the Norwegian coast, yeah? because the Germans also always thought there might be some a minor allied landing somewhere in Norway or perhaps in Denmark. Good, let's have a look at the Atlantic Wall. Oops, where is it? Come on, Atlantic Wall. Here we are. Or the order to erect the Atlantic Wall was already given in December 1941, personally by Hitler. But in the in 1942 and early 1943, not a lot of work had been done on this Atlantic Wall. This all changes when Rommel arrives in France in late 1943. Because he sees this as the main tool to defeat the Allies. A question for a long time had been for the Germans, should the enemy, should the, if the enemy lands, should he be destroyed on the sea or on land? In the end, it had to be decided on land, because on the sea would have required an operational, opera, uh, operational Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine. So if you go to Normandy and look at the bunkers, very often you will, very often, always you will see that the guns point not towards the sea, they always point on the beaches. So what are the effects that the Germans hope to, hope to achieve with the Atlantic Wall? It was not about completely destroying the enemy on the beach. That was something the Germans knew they, that's not something they can't achieve. But at least the enemy forces should be disrupted on the beach. Furthermore, the enemy forces should be, no, I don't know whether I've got the right term, canalize or channel, I don't know, I just used the German word, canalisieren, uh, our German Lieutenant Colonel can uh, certainly approve this. And uh, third point is buy time, yeah? to buy time until the Germans reserves can be brought forward to the coast. The key concept is here a combination of a static defense in the bunkers and a mobile def uh, uh, defense with reserves further in the hinterland, yeah? in the local reserves and further up to, up to the armored reserves. On, on D-Day itself, the Atlantic Wall was far from being complete. So just to show you what, what it would look like, the Atlantic Wall, I'll give you here an example for Omaha Beach, where the Americans landed 29th uh, US Infantry Division and 1st US Infantry Division. Here, all these circles are Widerstandsnester, which translates into a resistance nest. So in the end, it was uh, a bunker. And, yeah, where are they? 
Come on. Here they are. The local reserves, they are placed only 2, 2K inland, and you would have further reserves here and down there and in the, in the ground floor and so forth and so on. Okay. Um, right, so that's a static defense. And that would be the mobile defense. So if the Allies land here, let the American come. Chuck, chuck, chuck. Oh, PowerPoint, fantastic. Um, what is clear? The Allies, if they land, have to, they, have to get, they have to get away from the beaches as possible, as quickly as possible, and drive inland, yeah? Exits, yeah? Here, exits the, along the roads. Ah. Channel or canalize enemy attacks, yeah? One effect. And if you canalize them, then, next point, local reserves, the mobile ele ele element comes in, kicks in, and attacks in the flanks uh, until further reinforcements could come from further down there. Uh, Germans love attacking in the flanks, by the way. Left flanking, right flanking, uh, all this kind of business. Right, um, where do the Germans actually expect the Allies to land? There's a big hype has been made in historiography and already during the Second World War about Operation Fortitude, yeah, this great deception plan. And that the Germans were totally taken on the wrong foot which, in my opinion, is only partly right if we look at the German sources. Fortitude played a role, yes, but this is not to say that the Germans fully neglected Normandy. So Jodl, General Jodl, the uh, chief of the staff of the German armed forces, for him it was clear the Allies would land somewhere in northern France and Belgium within their fighter range, yeah, in order to provide the landing troops close air support. So there must have been someone here. And perhaps the Allies would launch some... Uh, Diversionary attacks, perhaps in Brittany, or particularly in the south southwest, or also perhaps in the Mediterranean. Hitler himself, in May 90 or April, May 1944, he explicitly states we shouldn't neglect Normandy. Perhaps the Allies may also land in Normandy. So, it is wrong to believe that the Germans focused solely on the Pas de Calais. They also had Normandy in mind as a potential Allied landing site. And only to reinforce this point, when you look at the German armored reserves, yeah, here these are the, all the German armored reserves. Um, when we look at those who were ready for combat on D-Day, because it, most of the German armored forces were still refitting, those were the ones that were combat ready on D-Day. Three behind the Normandy landing sites, and only one would have been here at the Pas de Calais, yeah? so it raises further questions about uh, where the Germans um, did the Allies expect to land. Oh, 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 yeah, great, great, that's, that's fantastic. fantastic, I love that. Uh, um, this shows you just, these three, to just to show you, to highlight again this uh, mess with command and control. These were the three divisions that were subordinated to the OKW, to the High Command of the German Armed Forces, and they could only be released by the personal order of Hitler himself. Uh, the rest could be deployed by the Army Group, those three divisions only by the Führer himself. Uh, command and control. Hooray! German strength prior to D-Day. The Germans were actually quite positive about uh, about throwing the Allies back into the sea before they landed. So, their thinking was based, or their optimism was based on a number of facts. First of all, the Germans had accumulated or gained a lot of combat experience, particularly their carters, from long, long fighting on the Eastern Front. They also had a quite effective doctrine, uh, the maneuverist doctrine, which we also learn now in the British Army, or have been, been part of the doctrine for years now. Then the Germans were quite flexible with their Kampfgruppen, so the battle troop group organization, so they could yeah, react quickly to ever-changing um, situations on the, on the battlefield. Low-level initiative, I'll just give you the uh, keyword mission command. And also they had some effective hardware. Yeah? Here you see the Panther tank, MG42, fearsome weapon. And the Sturmgewehr, the Assault Rifle 44, even though the Assault Rifle 44 wasn't deployed in Normandy, or oh, I think, uh, I don't know. Um, can't know everything. Um, even though this photo was taken on the Eastern Front. Okay, so at the start of the, on D-Day, the Germans looked quite opti optimistic to the upcoming fight. 
and thought this may change again the, for, the fortune of the war. So, D-Day itself, how did it happen to for the Germans? Well, shortly after the Allies landed, British broadcast that they found a number of German soldiers in their bunker in their underpants. And Hitler, when he learned about this, he was furious. Oh my word, my, my, my army was sleeping. Um, in reality, it turned out, no. The soldiers in the bunkers were already alerted. They were ready for action. The problem was only further behind in the hinterland with the reserves. So, much more problematic for the Germans was the, or was the absence of the key commanders in Normandy. Some of them were at a war game in Brittany or just returned in the night. And Rommel himself wasn't in Normandy either. He was on the 6th of June in Germany celebrating his wife's birthday. Why? Because he thought the weather is so shit, the Allies won't land. Huh? But the Allies did the unexpected. And they did land on the 6th of June, as we all know. Huh? So Rommel was at home. Huh? Tough luck for him. And he came back to Normandy or to France only in the late afternoon on the 6th of June when it was already too late. It's the irony because Rommel himself always considered the 24 hours of the battle to be the crucial moments. Uh, and he was away. And Hitler himself, sleeping army. <laughs> no, Hitler himself was asleep. Uh, and we, I told you earlier, he could only re release the armored reserves, and which would have been so crucial in the first hours after the Allied landing, but no one dared to wake him up. Yeah, if the Führer is asleep, yeah, let him sleep. Um, another fact that is perhaps not always uh, emphasized enough, in my opinion, is how heavily outnumbered and outgunned the Germans were on the landing beaches on, on D-Day. Utah Beach, yeah, where, where one American division landed, only 100, 100 men defending. Gold Juno, oh, that's not gold, it's also sword. Uh, British and a Canadian landing sectors. You also see not a lot of people def defending. And even in Normandy, what, uh, sorry, on Omaha, where it was hardest for the Allies to land, for the uh, Americans, even there, only 1,000 men in the bunkers and in the immediate local reserves. So with further re reserves, Coming in on D-Day, I think you could say <coughs> about 20,000 Germans were facing 150,000 Allies. Yeah, on D-Day itself, the Allies had landed 150,000 men. Just to give you some other um, figures, sorties, yeah, aircraft. 12,000 sorties on D-Day from the Allied side. German side, only 300. Yeah. Uh, you can't win a war with the German Luftwaffe. Um, Kriegsmarine, yeah, the German Navy, also didn't do much. The only thing they did, they, were, they sunk one Allied uh, ship that was an, or battleship, or well, it wasn't a battleship, it was just a destroyer, a Norwegian destroyer. So, landing succeeds from an Allied perspective very quickly in the first hours. And, as I already said earlier, the local reserves up from divisional level and further above, it is an extremely, uh, I call it a cock up uh, from the German side. So, they were alerted too late or perhaps sent to the wrong um, landing beach. Uh, for instance, I mentioned here Kampfgruppe Meyer, Battle Group Meyer, which always shifted between Omaha Beach and, uh, and Gold Beach without doing anything positive on either side. Um, same is true for the armored reserves. I said that Hitler himself was asleep. And the Supreme Commander West and uh, in Rommel's absence, his Chief of Staff Speidel, they also hesitate to deploy uh, their reserves because they are not fully aware whether this is the major landing. Yeah? Where, whether on D-Day this is just perhaps a faint attack and the main landing will be perhaps somewhere else. And when they deploy, and then they understand this is the main landing, that's around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and they release the armored reserves and deploy them, it's already too late. Yeah. Um, on D-Day itself, you've got only one successful German counterattack carried out by the 21st Panzer Division, which shows uh, 
might have been possible if the Germans had deployed their armed forces with full de de determination that they may have had enjoyed a bit more success on D-Day. However, on the evening, German 7th Army has to admit that it is impossible with the means available to throw the Allies back into the sea. So, whose fault was it, uh, from a German perspective, that the Allies could land? I would say everyone's fault uh, in the high command. Perhaps you can say an exception was 7th Army and 84th Corps in Normandy. They quickly understood this is the main landing, but on army group level and in the OKW, so in the high command of the German armed forces, everyone reacted far too slowly. So there's also been often questioned, could the Germans ward it off the Allied landing on D-Day? I think this is quite a theoretical question. In reality, this would, is, was almost impossible. Perhaps the Germans had, would have had a small chance to succeed if a number of factors had been put into reality. So some of them were, would have been command and control problems would have had to be solved before D-Day. The Germans would have had to predict the correct time and location of the landing. Both they didn't get it fully right. The Atlantic Wall wasn't complete, so it should have been complete, perhaps also with a second line of defense, but further inland. And it would have required a quick and determined reaction on D-Day. None of these factors uh, happened as they should have happened on D-Day, and that is why the Germans had no chance on D-Day at all. So, Allies landed, but the battle is not over. The battle now really starts only, and how did the Germans try to conduct this battle in the following week? Um, <clears throat> the German plan was to regain the initiative as quickly as possible. Yeah? And their maneuverist style, concentrated armored formations should pierce uh, the Allied front and throw the Allies back into the sea. The Germans did not, as often has been brought up, thanks to fortitude, the Germans did not expect a second landing at the Pas de Calais. For instance, 18th of June, Hitler is in Margival in France, and in the conference note, Hitler, which are, are now in the archives, clearly, Hitler clearly says, this is the main Allied landing, yeah? There won't be a second landing, perhaps only a diversionary attack at the Pas de Calais, but the Allied main landing is now hap has now happened in Normandy. The German reinforcements arrive so slowly because the Germans lack the means of transport. That is the main problem. It's not the French resistance or that the Germans deliberately held some of the reserves back. No, it's the lack of transport. One example would be, for instance, the planned counterattack of 1st SS Panzer Corps, west of Caen. On the days after D-Day, it was postponed four times until the headquarter of the Panzerkoppe West was eliminated by a RAF airstrike. And after five days, after D-Day, all Germans' hopes of an immediate counterattack counter against the landing beaches totally vanished. Germans faced a number of problems throughout the battle. I've already mentioned the slow and piecemeal arrival of reinforcements. And when reinforcements arrived, they normally couldn't counterattack they normally had to plug in gaps where the Allies seemed to break through the German front. Um, so this photo is quite interesting. It shows American infantry advancing over a, yeah, over, over, over a road, and here you've got destroyed German kit. That is quite symptomatic for the, for the uh, Normandy battle. First, the Allies destroy Allied kit, and then they advance with the infantry. That's the normal procedure, Allied procedure. So the Allies were very much aware, don't let the Germans fight their war of maneuver, but instead try to hammer the Germans down and impose your own kind of battle, your attritional battle, onto the enemy. So another problem for the Germans, supply. Oh, I already highlighted it before the, war, before the landing, also after the landing was the same. 
Seventh Army, for instance, calculated that per day it would require 3,200 tons of supply for an average day of fighting. In reality, only 1,300 tons arrived. So only probably about a bit more than a third of the supplies. Again, give you some examples how this was looked in reality. In June 1944, only 37% of the German ammunition reached the front line and only 60% of the fuel. Largely responsible for this was the Allied dominated the skies. Yeah? So there was a totally lack of air cover for the Germans. There was a saying amongst, amongst German soldiers, if it's daytime and you can see skies, uh, planes in the skies, it is the Royal Air Force. If it's nighttime and you see planes in the sky, it's the US Army Air Force. If you look into the sky and there are no airplanes, it's a German Luftwaffe. Yeah? So, huge problem also on morale. Yeah? You can imagine circling, if you've got planes circling around you uh, all day and all night, that's not very helpful for your own morale. Um, Allied naval bombardment. Next problem. Um, the Allies can fire up to 20 uh, miles inland and each time the Germans assemble armored formations in the hinterland for a counterattack, they have already disrupted by a naval bombardment before the attack can start. Uh, happens again and again. Rommel urges Hitler to pull, to, uh, to withdraw uh, outside the uh, naval gunfire range, but Hitler says, no, we are not retreating here a single inch. I would say centimeter. Um, right, Allied material superiority. I already mentioned some of the some of the figures. Yeah, for instance, in the sky, in the skies with the airplanes, we've got a ratio of about thirteen to one in favor of the Allies, and even in tanks. So you think the weapon the Germans see as their own trump card? Even in tanks, you've got a ratio of about three to one in favor of the Allies. So the German army gets slowly bogged. Uh, worn down and they cannot fight their preferred battle of maneuver and are forced and grind down in a battle of attrition. Just to give you one example of what it looked like, uh, in late June Hitler sends reinforcements, one Panzer Corps, uh, 2nd SS Panzer Corps to the west in order to launch a counter-offensive. The aim is uh, from the area west of Caen here would be core, with, uh, with five armored divisions, three infantry divisions, pierce the Allied front and then split the forces up to the left and to the right, or west and the east, and encircle them. Yeah, that's what the Germans always love doing, encircling the enemy. Um, look quite uh, logical here at a glance. Also, the force is quite impressive. However, in reality, this was um, quite embarrassing for the Germans, this counterattack. First of all, the reinforcements arrived too slowly. And when they arrived, the armored reinforcements, they first had to plug gaps. This time, because the British had launched another grand offensive, Operation Epsom, here around Corps. So instead of concentrating the forces for a counterattack, the German armored, uh, armored forces had to uh, stabilize the front. And the British dominance in artillery was something the Germans couldn't cope with. Just to give you again some, 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 some figures. According to German estimates, in the first 10 days of July, the Allies, fi no, sorry, not the Allies, the British alone fired 464,000 rounds of artillery shells. The Germans in the same sector during the same period of time, only 60,000 rounds. So again, a ratio of eight to one in favor of the Allies. So the uh, full result, of this um, planned counteroffensive was the seizure of Hill 112, quite a dominating piece of ground to the southwest of Caen. But instead of piercing through the Allied front, the offensive had to be stopped due to high casualties after only one day. Hitler reacts by exchanging, exchanging his senior commanders, but it doesn't help. Ah, the Germans get worn down in a battle of attrition. Um, perhaps, because we're running out of time, what I want to say here, collapse of morale. The German morale 
interestingly, <laughs> does not collapse until early August. So what you can clearly see in Normandy, as long as the Germans had enough officers and NCOs, the morale was still intact. Uh, however, if, as, when officers and NCOs were lacking, people or soldiers ran away. Uh, um, crucial is also, when you look at the German collapse in Normandy, it is also largely a collapse of logistics. Uh, the Battle of Falaise, the final act of the uh, Normandy battle, when the uh, Allies well, seal or close the pocket in for, around Falaise and encircle the vast majority of the German troops fighting in Normandy. Um, they, after, the, after the battle was over, they investigated, the Allies investigated the battlefield and counted 470 German armored vehicles. Of these, 470 German armored vehicles, only 20% were destroyed. The rest would have been still operable. So this means the vast majority of the German vehicles were just abandoned because they lacked fuel and ammunition. Oh, uh, logistics, very important. Yeah, 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 I know that. Are there any loggies here? Yeah, what, one loggy, two, three, uh, uh, you see? Underrepresented, aren't you? Yeah, I always say it's so important. Uh, okay, okay uh, we have to drop this one again, as we did also earlier. Perhaps we can do it later for the discussion group. Ideology and atrocities and all. Oh. Out of a conclusion, I pose the question: Why did the Germans fight on after Normandy? Yeah? So that's something historians and also the militaries like in 1944, 1945, always asked themselves, the war was lost, why did the Germans still fight on? Uh, it's really a, a, a tricky question to answer. I can't give you a definite answer either, but perhaps give you, give you some food for thought. Just some background information and facts. 20th of July, plot against Hitler, so Stauffenberg and placing bombs and trying to kill Hitler. A number of the uh, plotters were senior commanders in the West. So for instance, the German military administration of occupied France, the commander was um, one of the main plotters. Then in Rommel's HQ, his chief of staff was a pl plotter. Um, Rommel himself, always a big point of debate. I have found some evidence that Rommel knew much more about the plot than we perhaps may think today. Um, so this impacted, and also a number of senior officers were quite even though they were not in the, didn't know that there was a plot going on, but in the West there was a number of senior commanders who were rather sympathetic with, the, with this uh, attempt on uh, Hitler's life. Um, Germans suffered extremely high casualties in the summer of 1944. So it was not only the defeat in Normandy, at the same time the Germans suffered a huge, even numbers, even a huge defeat on the Eastern Front, Operation Bagration, and also in Italy. So on three fronts, the Germans were withdrawing and suffering heavy defeats with over one million casualties and still kept on fighting. Uh, perhaps the Allies are, we don't have time to talk about Falaise and Anvil Dragoon. Um, so why did the Germans still keep on fighting? One point is that the C2 remained largely intact. Uh, so the Allies were unable to capture army or army group headquarters. And they were only able to capture two core HQs and a number of divisional HQs. But let's say the brain of the German army in the West, the C2, was not destroyed. Second was, even though the Germans in this attritional battle lost, horribly lost their not only men but also their almost all their equipment, equipment New equipment was quickly delivered to the front. August 1944, perhaps it's something you don't know, but now you know it, you know it in a second. August 1944 was the month of the war with the highest output of the German war industry. Despite all the bombing campaigns over Germany in the previous months. Yeah? August 1944, highest output. Um, German military leaders, leadership was always something, a mixture of carrot and sticks. Yeah? On the one hand, German Officers were very um, sharing the hardships with their men. 
on the front, but on the other hand, you had also a strict disciplinary uh, and rigid system. Throughout the war, about 20,000 German soldiers were executed by the military juridical, juridical system by war trials. Um, then German operational thinking, huh? maneuvers thinking, was always one event can trigger a full chain reaction that may lead to an unexpected outcome. Something where the German, or we could see in the campaign in 1940 in France, when the Germans broke through the French front at Sedan, it was one event that triggered many consecutive events and led to an interesting, uh, to an unpredictable outcome. And here, the Germans thought the same, yeah? If we are able, perhaps, to gain or to win a smaller operation, this can have knock-on effects with uh, unforeseeable, um, unforeseeable result. So overall, the Germans were certainly defeated in Normandy, but neither physically nor moral, morally destroyed. Um, morale now, I said it also, put it also up here. Now, from September 1944 onwards, the Germans are defending their homeland. Yeah? The Allies have approached the, uh, the, the borders, and the Germans are now defending their homeland. And this always means a boost in morale, not only for the Germans in any case. Um, after Normandy and after the German retreat from France and the liberation of France, there are a number of months of bloody fighting following on particularly, for instance, for the US Army, the bloodiest months of the war were not Normandy, but were December 1944 and January 1945. Yeah? But all this is another story, the fighting after Normandy. I've given you now an overview of the German perspective of the Normandy battle, and I would like to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>